Can I welcome everyone to the 18th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is a decision on whether to take item four of this meeting in private. We'll con be considering a draft report of an inquiry into attainment and achievement of school aged children experiencing poverty. Are members content to take item four and any future considerations of a draft report in private? Thank you. The next item on our agenda is the second evidence session on young people's pathways. Last week we heard from a number of organisations involved in the delivery of the recommendations of the Commission for Developing Scotland's Young Workforce. On Sunday, Monday and Tuesday of this week we visited the Shetland Islands for a fascinating visit looking at the experiences of school students and staff, college students and staff, local businesses and third sector representatives and apprentices in the workplace. And I would like to put on record my sincere thanks to everyone who made this fact-finding so worthwhile and enjoyable. This week, we are joined by Sir Ian Wood and Jennifer Craw. Can I warmly welcome you both to the meeting? Sir Ian was the chair of the Commission on Developing Young Workforce, Scotland's Young Workforce, and remains involved with the DEYW National Advisory Group. Jennifer provided support throughout the Commission's work. And can I invite you, Sir Ian, to make any introductory remarks? OK, thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, opportunity. Um, Jennifer actually wasn't on the Commission, but was an incredibly valuable participant in the Commission. Jennifer's worked with me in a number of um, um, projects and provided support and advice all the way through. So I'm delighted to have her um, with me here to, um, she'll help in any uh, whole range of areas. Um, first of all, I'm gonna say that the paper that um, you, you've got for today, which thank you was, um, was sent to us, um, is actually a very good paper. <laughs> I think it, 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 it has a really good, um, fairly succinct go at identifying the key issues and also the progress being made. So um, that was very helpful. Um, it was suggested that um, we might cover pretty briefly up front the, the really key issues, the heart of the issues that the, the Commission um, got involved with. Um, and I'm going to do that with there's maybe four or five of them. Um, I mean, the, the, the first one, I mean, I called it the neglected 50%. I actually wanted to call the report the neglected 50%, but I was told that wasn't the right thing to do, so we called the report something else. But, I mean, we, we, would, we, we, we visited a lot of schools, um, and we were very well received and, and well looked after. Um, but essentially, the first 10 minutes was taken with telling us all about the um, academic, academic achievements of the schools and how well they were doing with whatever, 80% higher passes. Um, and then we'd say, well, that's great. Um, can you tell us, please, about the, 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 the... And we never got the right words. I'm going to use non-academic. I don't like it, but it's either non-academic or vocational. Can you tell us about the non-academic youngsters who are not doing hires? And honestly, in a number of cases, there was an embarrassed silence. You know, when, when, have you got any figures on, on how many qualifications they're leaving school with? And, you know, what, what's the, and, 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 and that hit us right up front. Um, and, and, and alongside that, um, which clearly you guys have all very much, everyone's picked up, it's, it's, it's a real cultural thing about university being the be all and the end all. And therefore, anything that's not university, frankly, um, tends to get um, secondary um, consideration. Um, so, I mean, early on, we had in our heads, we need to get a much more focus on meaningful qualifications um, for the non-academic youngsters leaving school. There's no point in a kid staying on at school unless he's got something, he or she's got something to um, aim for. Um, so that was very much at the front of our uh, minds, that and, and um, employability. Um, so, there is an issue on parity of esteem, frankly, Parents are at fault, teachers are at fault, some schools are at fault. I, I think we're all at fault, frankly. Um, my mother was desperate for me to be a professional person, and that was really all she ever wanted. Um, and that was essentially um, going to uh, um, university. Um, secondly, we, we, we um, so, so very quickly from there, we went on to the concept of college partnerships. How can we get um, as quickly as possible vocational teaching capacity. And it wasn't really that difficult to work out that um, the colleges had a, a lot of the vocational facilities and resources and lecturers. Um, and therefore, if we could build a really strong bridge 
between the schools and the colleges, um, that was one way to significantly expand it. We actually got a number of things wrong. Um, I, I mean, I guess we thought that that could expand into the first year of HNC and first year of the modern apprenticeship, and neither of these yet have come about. Um, so we, we were looking for meaningful qualifications that when the, the youngster left school, um, it would take them in, on some kind of pathway. Um, and, and, and I don't think there's any youngsters right now at school doing the first year of an HNC, and I don't think yet we've really graduated into youngsters doing um, modern uh, apprenticeships. And actually, the focus just now is on foundation apprenticeships, which are great ideas, but they don't help the neglected 50%. The qualifications and the level for foundation apprenticeships is actually above what the um, the, the, the youngsters that we were really concerned about um, do. They, they're a great concept. I'm not I'm not going to denigrate them at all. Real concern about career advice, um, and career advice is not easy. <laughs> it absolutely is not an easy easy one to um, to get on top of. But but a huge mixed quality of career advice, very poor work experience. Um, in terms of preparing kids for employability, there's no better way to do that than give them some real um, work experience. Um, and, 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 and frankly, um, for a number of reasons, that, that just wasn't there. Um, we greatly valued apprenticeships for a number of reasons, um, and particularly what's now called modern skilled apprenticeships. Um, and interestingly, they're focused on modern skills. But what we all need to understand is modern skills are changing so fast in front of our eyes. I mean, digital is going to change just a whole range of um, way in which we design the, um, the appropriate way to get youngsters ready for what's going to be a very different world. So um, modern apprenticeships we, 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 we greatly um, valued. And then the, last, the second part of our report was focused on business and, uh, and um, industry. Um, I think there's probably been reasonable progress made there. There's still a very disappointing lack of um, youngsters being employed directly from education into uh, um, business. There's a very poor take up of uh, apprenticeships um, and SMEs have a particular problem there. We actually suggested that there should be some financial incentive for SMEs to take on apprenticeships. I think that's probably the only significant recommendation we made that wasn't taken up. But we felt there's particular problems with an SME take, if 20% of our SMEs took on apprenticeships, we'd solve all kinds of um, problems. Um, so we, th we thought that was worthwhile and that wasn't picked up. I'm, I'm probably going to stop there. So that's, that's me looking, looking back. Um, but obviously, um, as we go on, um, we have thoughts on just how much progress has been made on the various recommendations. Thank you very much for that. Um, but despite, the, you, you've certainly said that there's a number of things that still have to be done and despite that there does seem to be a fair deal of progress and one of the witnesses last week was talking about the the, the wide support that developing young workforces had from all sorts of sectors so could you tell us what, what's your views on the challenge in, in coordinating a program that involves so many different types of stakeholders and for example the establishment of distinct vocational pathways can be routed through college training providers uh, and businesses is there a, the additional challenge of ensuring schools pupils and parents know the benefit of these different pathways and what they present yeah well it's a very significant challenge because there's a number of stakeholders um with um with pretty different approaches and um views um i mean the the, the key players are the schools themselves and the recognition within the schools that there's it's not black and white, but there's clearly some very strong um, academic content and there's also um, a large content which is um, vocational. The colleges have a very important role to play. I mean, the colleges, if you like, are the, they're the kind of, um, they're the kind of main training resource for the non-academic um, youngsters if, if, if they're gonna go into some kind of further um, education the universities themselves um, have a role to uh, have a role to play. Um, so so we, we try to spell out what we saw was the developing relationship. So clearly we established a relationship um, between schools and um, colleges. And it's very important that that, that that is developed. We try to establish the basis of relationship between schools and business. And, and, and I think that's probably got a, 
probably got a 60% um, pass mark. I mean, there has been significant progress. On, on, on most of our recommendations, there has been real progress. Um, and, 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 that, and that's very um, positive. There isn't a single all-embracing, if we do this and everyone's going to come together. There's, 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 there's a number of important dichotomies here where you're trying to connect key players together to do the right things. Uh, very disappointed you don't have a magic bullet there, Sir, Sir Ian. There isn't a magic bullet. Yeah, there never is. The never. Exactly, there very seldom is. Yes. Can, can I ask on one subject that you mentioned there, you were talking about careers advice. Do you think that it would be helpful uh, for companies and colleges and uh, other organisations to, to go into schools earlier than they do just now, not to, to sort of point them to one uh, industry or whatever, but just to say, here are the types of options that you've got. Because it's, it seemed to us, when we were visiting some schools just over the last couple of days, that, that what happened was that people were making their choices before they knew what they were going to do, and therefore they were heading down a path that they might decide they didn't want to do. So would there be some benefit in, in going in earlier? Do you mean primary school? No, no. Well, maybe, I mean, there's some talk, I think it was, uh, I was talking to somebody just recently who was saying that they go in P7 now. But I don't think that's universal at all. It, it is happening, because by chance I know a little bit about it, because on the Family Foundation side, we have been looking at, it's been done in, in, in England to some extent, where there's actually quite a, a, a lively um, movement towards um, linking businesses into primary schools and actually getting people to go into primary schools and, and talk about careers and... Uh, I think, it's, I think it's helpful, but I think much more important is to get the right involvement in, in a, a secondary school. It's kind of senior one, two, and three. I think that's when uh, there's likely to be some kind of, um, not a decision, but an orientation towards, I might do this, I might do that. An awful lot of youngsters don't have it. <laughs> you know, they, leave, <laughs> they leave school and they still don't have it. Um, careers advice is not easy, but it is so important. And the computerised version, I think, is now more user-friendly um, and I think is being well used. But there's absolutely nothing to beat, um, particularly a young person in whatever profession they've chosen, whatever job they've chosen, going into the school and standing in front of the youngsters and talking to them and telling them and letting the youngsters ask questions. Nothing to beat that. OK, thank you very much. I'll, I'll just... Uh, Gillian, I'll ask Gillian to ask this. Yeah, I want to pick up, and good morning, and I want to pick up on something you said um, that I, I think that we've all found has been, been speaking to uh, young people in particular about their choices at school, and that's the influence of parents. And you mentioned your own personal experience that's similar to mine. University was a be-all and end-all for a lot of parents. What, what, can, what, what can we do to engage parents more and, and, and let them know a little bit more about the value of what's out there and, and uh, get to a point where parents don't have a kind of tunnel vision when it comes to their, their, their children's options. We are trying to change culture here. We are trying to change a kind of long embedded view um, but somehow the really worthwhile thing in life is to go to um, university and so many parents have got that as the uh, aspiration for the youngster. Um, we, we met, was it National Parents Association? Yes. Yeah, so we met, that was actually a really interesting meeting. Um, cause, so this, 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 this obviously is an enlightened group, you know, they're interested and involved in, in the, and even some of them at various stages in the discussion, honestly, there were there were pennies dropping. There, were, there was in terms of the thinking and the way they were thinking. Um, I think I think we absolutely need to make apprenticeships and and, 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 and trades occupations and what have you, we need to make it more respectable. I mean, we need doctors, we need lawyers, we need people to look at the plumbing in the house. We, I mean, we, we need we need a whole range of different things. And we need to find a way um, to make that, um, we need to increase the prestige of it. Uh, I mean, frankly, what, what's our experience in North East of Scotland is that the, a lot of the youngsters who in fact didn't go to university but, but did a really good technician training, 
they're earning more. If it's money, they're earning more than than a lot of the professional people are um, earning. So, so but money is money is only part of it. Um, I mean, my 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 dad had a, a fishing business, um, which I went into. I shouldn't have, but I, but I did because my dad had poor health, and my mum just desperately didn't want me to go into the fishing business. That was in for a dig. So some of these old-fashioned ideas and concepts still very much exist. I think it's making these alternative, the vocational occupations, everyone's got to get a, a mindset change into understanding they are worthwhile, they are essential, they're as equally part of society as other things that we do. Um, teachers in school are incredibly important. Um, I actually think parents are the root of the problem. <laughs> But I think teachers, if you like, are the next stage up because a lot of teachers believe that their success is based on um, how many um, hires their children get and their their their, their um, kids get. So, so, and we've got it. We've got to change. This is on the agenda. We've got to change the way in which schools are appraised. So we're no longer just appraising schools on the old traditional higher passes or the academic passes, um, and we need to highlight the importance of. Um, the way in which we can significantly enhance the number of vocational youngsters leaving school with qualifications. It's only improved very slightly. I think it's gone from 7% to 10% or 11% or something. That means 40% are leaving school with nothing. That, that change in that reputation and the prestige you mentioned that is about how it's reported and getting like the wider like the media to understand what the, what's positive about all these destinations um, and then when the reports come in about higher passes and all the rest that so seems to be the be all and end all and that feeds into that narrative that parents are still thinking that apprenticeships are, are a lesser option yeah i mean this just has to be a personal view i mean I think we can blame the media for a whole range of things. I don't think we can blame them for that culture. I think the culture begins with um, parents and with teachers. I really do. Um, and that's where we've got to affect the, uh, that's where we've got to affect the change. So there's got to be a big effort in schools. I mean, the headmaster or headmistress has got a huge impact on the culture in the school. We could almost tell when we'd done a number of schools, um, this wasn't us being particularly clever, it's just we, we got a kind of sense. We could almost tell what we wouldn't at the school within the first 10 minutes, whether there was any serious attempt at vocational education in the school. It, it wasn't just there in the facilities, it was there, there in the way the headmaster or headmistress spoke, it was there in the way the teachers spoke, and we always spoke to youngsters in the school as well. Um, so it's not difficult to tell a school that. We're four years out of date, or maybe five years out of date. So I, I, I really, well, it has changed because because I've been to a couple of schools in the last couple of years, and th th this is um, on the the committee I now sit on, whatever it's called, the overall committee. Um, but obviously they've chosen good schools, but but they've chosen really enlightened schools where there was a very very clear shift, recognizing that vocational education stood alongside academic education. So it is possible to do. Yeah, of course. I, one of the, the reflections from the original um, work that we did, I remember, and it's reflected in some of the evidence you've taken before, it was round about the application process for universities, and there's a lot of focus within schools around UCAS, and parents are, 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 are also introduced to how does this work, and then following that you've got the whole funding element. One of the key observations was how much more fragmented any education pathway outside universities can seem and feel and be so not just access to college but equally access to modern apprenticeships so that simplicity of the UCAS process and the focus of it within a school environment it's very difficult to replicate that for both college FE and also the modern apprenticeships so that that piece of infrastructure that's been invested in for university education has still not it's still not there for the other education pathways or pathways to work. Um, so that, I think, has, is reflected in some of the evidence you've taken. Complex on. and confusing at this point. It, it's not known. Right. So it's still not known. And, and what I know, particularly from an Aberdeen um, perspective, what has become better known is the, the 2 plus 2 degree route to, to college and to university. And that's one route, but it still ends up being the focus is on degree. So it can be done. You can introduce new pathways, and that can 
filter down, but it's not easy if you're looking at an apprenticeship and it's, it's more difficult doing college applications because you don't have this single focus in the same way that you do have for universities. So that still is, is a challenge, both parents and career and teachers and employers, actually, in terms of how they make it work. Right. Thank you. Morning. I would just like to go on about uh, the parity of steam just my colleague Gillian was talking about. And Serene, you said that in your opening remarks as well, university have been seen as the be all and end all. And also your own mother wanted to, you to become a professional person. Well, you didn't turn it too bad, Serene. So, you know, it's uh, the whole thing is if you look at parents and how we can use them as a driving force to, for change as well, is it not the case that there may be some more for the business world to actually come into uh, education and actually tell the potential career paths uh, for young people to try and get that prestige and also potential earnings. Because nine times out of ten with parents in particular, the potential earnings is always the one that seals the deal. Yeah, I mean, of course. The answer, the answer to that is absolutely of course. And, 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 and I do think that the, the DYW groups I think there's 21 around the, is it 21 around the country now, and, and, and that's growing. Uh, I do think that's part of their um, responsibility in, in, in building up the, the partnerships between business and um, particularly um, secondary schools. Um, we must get more, and, and, and it's got to be young people. It's, it's got to be people that the kids can relate to. We must get more young people um, into schools um, and literally just talking through what they do and talking about their earnings and, and what, whatever they're doing, whether they're a doctor or a what, what, what fireman or what, whatever it is they're doing, um, and, 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 and get kids to hear the story as it is. So that's, that's a motherhood question, and I completely, that, that's, that's, that's a no-brainer. We need to significantly <coughs> enhance that. Um, and in my opinion, that's much better than career advice because they can ask a whole bunch of questions. I know you can ask some questions in the... Uh, mm -hmm career program but but you can ask a whole bunch of um, you can ask a whole bunch of questions so that's just a no-brainer we we also had a uh, UWS principal Craig Mahoney in here and he said that he had uh, some kids in his institution young people who didn't drop out of university but opted into a new career and he saw that as a success they didn't graduate but they actually saw university became a from that institution an option for them to go some down a vocational side of things you know is it possibly maybe in higher education there should be more kind of ideas like that as well where they possibly there is that kind of balance between saying well people can change their career because people change subject matter but the idea of changing well from academic to vocational uh, would probably be seen as a radical idea it's a funny roundabout way to do it uh -huh. <laughs> i mean i would much rather that, See, that, in all that, honesty, the, the institution I'm talking about comes from a technical college background, so uh -huh. that's probably part of the reason uh -huh. why the, uh -huh. it's more historic uh -huh. than anything else. And much rather that we, we, we had a very significant focus and effort and resource into trying to help the youngsters to make the right career decision, whether it's university or whatever it is, at school, um, and get them started off on the right path. Honestly, because of the culture issue, a lot of youngsters go to university because their parents want them to go to university. And they've nothing against it. You know, it's another four years and university life is generally quite a good um, part of a, of a kind of um, lifetime for, um, for um, um, people. But they come out and they're still not sure what they want to do. You know, the qualification hasn't really helped them an awful lot. So, so it's, it's, it's people that go to university as well as those at Dogo University, that we want to try and ensure that they fully understand the implications of what they're doing. Final question, just on that actual point. You know, if, if I use my, my own father's background, it was different times, more brutal times, but he effectively, it was uh, educationally, the 11 plus, you either went down grammar route or you went down uh, modern secondary, and he went modern secondary. But then he ended up getting an apprenticeship at the local engineering firm and uh, became an engineer, had his own business. We all had a reasonable lifestyle uh, because of that work. In this modern age, that engineering business isn't there anymore. You know, in my local community, uh, the, that option probably wouldn't be there because he'd probably be encouraged to try and go down some kind of academic route. That. How do we get to something similar, but not as brutal a system? Yeah, you know, these opportunities are there. Um, 
I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a growing focus on how do we maximise um, support for what's called young entrepreneurs. I mean, your, your, your dad was actually a young entrepreneur setting out in his, on his own business. There's a lot of resources now being allocated towards that. Uh, some, of it's, some of it's digital. I mean, this world is changing. Some of it's um, um, digital, but it's certainly a lot of um, higher tech stuff. So what you call the engineering businesses, there's a whole lot of them there. There's not enough, but there's a whole lot of them there. And, and there is the opportunity for young people to um, really now get fairly reasonable support if, 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 if they've got an inclination to start their own, uh, start their own business. Thank you. So the, you, you talked a couple of times already about uh, basically peer support, about young people coming in and, and giving their experiences. Would it be worthwhile, or does it happen, that maybe local authorities or business organisations or schools themselves try and uh, create a, a group of people that they can use to, to go into the schools and, and talk about their experiences for the benefit of the pupils? I, I think that's what some of the DYW groups are doing. So, so they're definitely encouraging their employer members to do exactly that. I'm not sure whether they've got a formal list, but, but, but I'm quite sure they're actively, in fact, I know they're actually doing that in some, some areas. I mean, I, I know within our region, DYW are focusing very much on the sectors and the business links and partnerships, and then across those key partnerships, what you tend to find is one leader who will then try and harness other companies to come in behind them and, and, and share that. I think the other point I was going to also um, add to the apprenticeship discussion and question. We are piloting with SDS and SRUC and others in the northeast of Scotland a shared apprenticeship scheme in agriculture. So I think that other, if there's no small engineering company anymore and large employers are really important in terms of providing apprenticeships, there might be other more um, flexible models that we could develop within a Scottish context to support SMEs. And I think it'll be interesting, we're just out recruiting for that at the moment, and it'll be interesting to see that, how that actually works. So A, we're trying to attract people into agriculture, and B, we're trying to address the issue of no single farm can, can, can train up in all the areas that the apprentice needs. So that, I think, is going to be an interesting model, and I'm sure it could be replicated in other sectors. Certainly the food and drink industry are interested in it as well. Yeah, it would certainly be helpful if the committee could yep. get some detail about yep. that. It's just, just recruiting now. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> it's take a year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Liz. Good morning, Sir Ian Wood. Um, could I ask uh, about the uh, sort of structure within schools? Um, and could I start with the Curriculum for Excellence, which, as you know, has eight areas, um, which are obviously fundamental to the education of any child. Do you think that employability should be uh, added to that group? I'm just, I'm just debating on the word added. I mean, employability should run through a number of these eight areas. I mean, it, it, it's, we don't just put youngsters to school to get them a job. We put youngsters to school for a whole lot of really good reasons, um, because it's, it's, an essential, it's an essential part of developing into a, a, a successful, um, contributing citizen. Um, but part of it has to be to try and ensure they get a job. Um, and therefore, whatever possible um, in the, the various areas in Curriculum for Excellence, um, there absolutely should be a focus on... Uh, and and you, you mustn't make it too blatant. There's a degree of subtlety in this as well. Um, so that um, youngsters, we don't kind of overwhelm youngsters. But, but, but part of the motivation in a young person going to school, if they're going to be a good citizen, they've got to be employable. But it, it raises a, an interesting question then, because you, you started out this morning by talking about the 50% that you feel are being let down. Do you feel that being let down in school is a difficult issue within the Curriculum for Excellence because it's not quite focusing on the employability skills that we would like in order to develop all the ambitions that you have? I think the answer to your question is yes, but, but I, I, again, I put it a different way. I think we're letting these youngsters down, or we were letting these youngsters down. I really hope it's, 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 um, it's improving significantly. We were letting them down by having no interest and no focus on them. Honestly, no interest and no focus on them. They were filling positions at school. I, I, frankly, I wonder why some of them stayed on. Um, a lot of them would have been an awful lot better leaving school whenever they could at the end of year four. And, and, and when we ask, can you actually show us what kind of 
um, education they're getting, what are they being taught, what's, what's, um, it, was just, it was just filling in. So, so in that case, what do we have to do to ensure that the qualification, and I stress qualifications, not exams necessarily, what do we have to do within schools to provide the quality of the qualifications that will assist those who are not going to follow uh, a university career? Uh, you mentioned when you opened up this, this morning about the possibility of HNC, HND within schools. Is that something that you think can really help in terms of uh, providing a greater quality of provision within the school to give youngsters a, a better um, basic uh, training before they head out into either yeah, college it, it work? It doesn't just give them a good basic training, it actually gives them a qualification. Um, uh, I said this hasn't been as successful as we hoped, um, but I understand that, that, that um, we're, we will be up to about six, six and a half thousand youngsters in school going to college, um, I think next year or the year after next. So, so the, the numbers are building up. And the idea is they spend maybe two days a week at college. So they're in school, but they go to college two days a week. Um, and, and our view was that an HNC, um, was one of the opportunities, and modern, modern apprenticeship is another one, where they could do the first year in, in, in school, but studying at college. So when they leave school, they've actually got a year under the belt. They've also got a year's knowledge as to what it means, and a better idea as to whether they actually want to do it or not. Um, so that, so, and and there's, a, there's a bunch of other things that we felt we could do in school with um, attendance. Now you may say, why don't they just leave and go to college? Um, I mean, there was a clear view expressed to us that a lot of youngsters aren't ready for that. And if, if we could give them the combination of staying in the school environment and culture, but getting, and, and, and actually getting a couple of days at university, that's a great insight into, you know, the future world. So it's a really good combination there. I, I don't disagree with you at all, but that, that would inevitably mean slight structural change um, for uh, S3, S4, S5 and S6 within they schools. I mean, uh, we stumbled on this. Um, I don't know, was it West Lothian? There was actually, there was actually, it was early on, fortunately, there was one meeting we went to um, and we met the, we met the, yeah, we went, to, we went to the college and we met the principal of the college um, and one of our senior staff and um, two people there from the Education Authority. And they were planning for the next year how they, so they'd started a pilot program, which was about kids in school spending one or two days a week at college. And, 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 and they, were, they were planning next year's um, extension, the, the, the second year of the pilot program. And honestly, that, that, was, that was a eureka to me, um, frankly. Yeah, East Lothian, yeah, yeah, that was, that was eureka. Um, so, so it was there but in a tiny, tiny, tiny way. And, and I think the colleges have mixed views on it. I was, I, when I knew I was giving this evidence today, I've, I've spoken to two college principals um, as to how they think it's going. Um, I think the correct thing for them to say is what they said to me, yes, we're, we're happy and it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's going well and numbers are increasing. I think there's a view is that we'd actually rather have them direct into college rather than take them through school. And I asked one of them that, they just smiled. Um, but the fact is, it, it, it is, it is on the increase, it is happening. We don't have the funds to make a big investment in vocational facilities and schools. And, and the colleges are actually pretty good at what they're, what they're doing. We just, for some reason, we've, we've, we've missed out on HNC and we're not yet doing significant uh, modern, first year modern apprenticeships. Uh, thank you, my last uh, question would be just to push you a little bit further on that, and whether you think that we would have to make some changes uh, to the structure, particularly, as I say, of S3, once subject choice has taken place, uh, through S4, S5, S6, to make sure that there is a very clear pathway uh, to the different routes once the pupil has left, whether that's at the end of S4, S5 or S6. Um, what you're suggesting is that there is a lot more quality in the system than is perhaps being used. Can we, 
can we just push you a little bit further as to whether the quality in the system? From, well, you, from you're, you're flagging up that you think that things are getting better, and that there, you know that there is some real quality in the availability of HNC possibilities, etc. Is, is all there technically, but is it actually happening? In given the, the current structure of schools in Scotland, because I think if I could just bring back something you said when you came to the cross-party group on colleges and universities, you hinted that a little bit more had to be done to uh, develop the school structure to allow um, greater clarity of the pathways for some of our young people. <clears throat> I think the concept of pathways has really caught on. Um, and, and it's a really important concept um, for anyone studying. Um, even though they're not sure what they want to do, um, they should have a, a kind of view of the way ahead. Maybe three or four different pathways, you know, maybe, and, and then you split it into three or four different pathways. I think pathways is really important. It, th that wasn't raised as a problem. I mean, the schools, when we, when we spoke to schools about the concept of the one, um, two days a week at, at um, it, it, it was practical for them to handle. It actually gave them a wider choice. And interestingly, some of the academic youngsters were interested in, in experience in college. I think the, the idea of a day out of school, um, you know, going to college and ex experiencing a different environment was actually quite attractive. So I'm sure, and, and I'm not, not up to date, um, Liz, so, but, but, but I'm sure um, the potential is there um, and I, I don't think there's any insurmountable structural issues which should allow us to get a much better combination of school and college education, mainly for vocational youngsters, but on a wider basis as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joanne? Yeah, um, thanks very much. I'm struck by some of what you're describing in terms of relationship with colleges. These were things we were doing 20 years ago in Glasgow, and it's perhaps one of the problems in education that people do interesting things on a small scale, but they don't necessarily then get that ro um, rolled out. I'm interested in what you're saying about the cultural mindset. Now, I was teaching for 20 years, but it is 20 years ago. And our problem was that, frankly, some folk in one profession and families didn't see their children going through an academic route. They, they didn't perceive it as an academic route. In fact, m most youngsters, even with good hires, cashed out at the end of their fifth year because they were wanting, this is in the 80s, wanting into work. And I wonder if I understand absolutely that schools ought not to be saying the be all and end all is um, a university education, but is there a concern on the other side that are presumptions and assumptions made about youngsters on the basis of where they live, about whether they should be doing academic work or not, and how do we make sure that we don't end up in a position where actually in some schools the offer is vocational because that's where you come from as opposed to academic. That, that would very much my anxiety around because I completely accept the issue about vocational education and, and valuing it properly with the youngsters I most enjoyed teaching. But how do we stop what was... One of the reasons why people have made such a thing about the importance of access to university and all the rest of it is precisely because back in the day it was seen that it was only for those and such as those. I, I'm sure you, 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 you experienced what you've described there. Um, that wasn't an obvious trend for us. I mean, we, we, we went to a whole range of different um, schools. Um, in some of the schools, uh, the, in the more disadvantaged areas, um, actually pride was taken um, by the teacher or the head, Mr. Master, telling us about um, whatever, eight or 10 or 12 youngsters from quite a large number who actually could go to university. You know, so, so they, were, they were seeing it as a, you know, and, and I, I don't think we sensed that um, there was just a kind of um, negative, everyone in our schools, you know, because it's a poor area, um, is, is going to finish up being a vocational. Um, but I suspect time has moved on. I, I think it's probably better than it was. I'd be, I'd be very sad if we were still facing that, that would be very mm. sad. I think as, as it's definitely moved on and it's progressed. My, my concern is that we end up in a position where it, the fashion moves from one thing to the other and we end up in a position where, I mean, presumably I'm getting very strongly a message from you that it is what is most appropriate for the young person and the school should be offering the relevant support, whatever 
their schools are. Um, I wondered whether you thought that um, the careers advice and support is sufficiently tailored to young people, sufficiently, sufficiently tailored for individuals. I mean, it feels to me that going onto a computer um, is one thing and it's useful, but the level of support that some young people might require is, is, is greater. And I wonder if you have a view on what that should really look like. What would be the reasonable expectation of um, the career advice you would get within school? I know employers can come in. What is it? And we had a guidance teacher in front of us last week who was talking about the other pressures on because of pastoral care responsibilities as well as careers advice. I wonder if you think sufficient progress has been made in that regard. I think we had a clear view that there was um, a huge variation in the quality of careers advice, and some of it um, clearly fell short of what it might. But we also had a recognition that it's actually a very difficult thing to do. Um, I mean, we had some interesting discussions with SDS um, on the issue of careers advice. Um, we had some interesting discussions on work experience, which was a you know, key part of it. If there was any way you could get a package of things, it wasn't just sitting behind a computer, but it actually involved some practical experience or someone coming and talking to you. you know, so sitting behind a computer just isn't enough at all, frankly. Um, so, so, so you need a combination. And, and, and frankly, some schools had a good package and they would tend to be the, the, the kind of less disadvantaged areas. In the disadvantaged areas, you know, there wasn't the same kind of support from parents and others to, to um, try and provide insight into some of the career um, opportunities. So we need to keep improving careers advice. We need to keep getting more work experience. Um, but there's definitely not a magic um, bullet for this. Can I ask one last question? Um, again, reflecting on my own experience, one of the biggest changes in my teaching career was when they brought in certification for all standard grades, which meant you had the Credit General Foundation. And immediately, resources had to follow all these courses. When, in the past, I taught non-certificate classes where there was no resource, there was no course, and it was just simply whatever you could magic up yourself. Are you concerned, or do you share my concern on the decision that a National 4 is internally assessed on a pass or fail which means, in my view, that it's less likely to be seen as, a, as significant a qualification when it's externally assessed, as the first point. And secondly, would you see your idea of you know, HNC or whatever filling that space because it would be externally assessed and it would be seen as having credibility for that group of young people? I don't think I've got enough knowledge to answer that question. I'm serious, I don't think I have. I don't, I don't. So we are four years out of date. Uh, and there's, there's been a change in, 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 in the four years um, in the process. Um, I, I don't... I, I, that's too much. That's a question that requires uh, more knowledge than I have of how that system works, I'm afraid. Do you think, though, it is entirely legitimate to see that external assessment <coughs> um, and qualification gives a value to what a young person has learned? I think that's the message I'm getting from you around why this you know, bridging into the school, out into the college works, and why should some of that not happen in the school? That same mindset would apply to what the national call for. So what you're saying, were. is there a value in it being external as opposed to just the internal? I guess it depends on the quality of the internal assessment and the reputation of the school for, for making a good job of that. Um, I mean, there has to be some advantage in, the, in, a, in, a, in a kind of external standard. It's, you know, people recognise that and it's credible form secondary education when we were sit finally in a position where youngsters were leaving school with qualifications as opposed to in the past being able to get all the way through for four or five years of school with no qualifications. Yeah. The, 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 the problem was a lot of these youngsters weren't just leaving school with no qualifications, they were leaving school with no aspirations. You know, there, there had been no pathway, they, they had no, they had no, um, you know, there's nothing worse and I've said this a number of times, and I really mean it, there's nothing worse than a young person waking up in bed in the morning and not having something to do. It's the worst thing we can do to a young person. So part of the answer to that is, is, is ensuring that we, we have a pathway and an aspiration 
which is there from whatever age, but certainly from kind of fourth year school, um, even third year school, they should have an aspiration to, to achieve uh, to achieve something, and 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 preferably yes. Um, how meaningful is, is is an internal qualification? It's better than no qualification. But if we can if we could get first year HNC um, or first year modern apprenticeship, and there's a number of other things we could do, that's meaningful. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Ross. I'd like to follow up this issue of choice. We've received, um, not just over the course of um, starting this inquiry, but previous work that the committee's done, a substantial amount of anecdotal evidence from young people who feel that whilst there might nominally be a choice presented to them uh, while they're at school for future pathways, that that choice has really already been made for them. And it's that challenge for us in distinguishing between where a school might have broadened the number of options available within it. It might have started, a, a school that previously was very focused on the academic routes to university might have started engaging far more uh, with vocational options, with colleges, with businesses for apprenticeship opportunities. That while they're doing that, the school themselves, teaching staff or potentially parents have essentially made those choices already for the young people. So the options are nominally there, but for that individual young person, there really wasn't a choice. The school might be offering more, but for them, the choice has already been made for them. Has Are you saying the restriction is the school curriculum restricting what they can do? Or are you saying it's the parents and the teachers? Parents and teachers rather than yeah, their own yeah, curriculum, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm in no doubt that, that um, the parents and teachers have a huge influence. And if you told them that, they'd probably disagree with you. Um, you know, that, that was one of the interesting things that the discussion with the Parents Association was, you know, how, 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 how do you discuss with your kids what they should and shouldn't do? Um, and, and I think in some cases from quite an early age, um, a lot of parents, it's, an, it's their aspiration. It's not the kids' aspiration, it's their aspiration. Um, and, 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 and if you really said to them, you know, you're, you're, you're unfairly and unreasonably influencing your child, I mean, the answer is, why not? You know, they just don't believe they are. And I don't think teachers really believe they are either. Um, and I, I think, actually, the teacher's issue is getting better. I think the younger teachers, um, you know, have a kind of somewhat different approach and different thought. Um, so I think the teachers, one, hopefully will get better over a period of time. But, but the, your, your kids you're talking to are absolutely right. Um, and maybe they don't realise it. See, I, you know, when it's happening, they don't have the insight to realise I'm getting a prejudiced view here, um, and 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 we have to find a way to counter that by, um, as I said, exposing them to work experience by getting people in school to talk to them about it, by films of different things. There's a whole range of ways we can do it. As to what 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 there is there there must be a choice, um, and you must be given enough information to make that choice. If we look at an example, of, you brought up uh, something similar a moment ago, um, an experience I had recently speaking to a young person who their uh, academic achievement would allow them to go to university. The school was very much directing them to go to university, but actually their interest was to uh, take a, a vocational route instead. How are we able to, to measure and assess that distinction between options nominally being available in a school and genuine choice being given to individual young people, to individual pupils. Because that's the challenge for us. The schools can present on paper that they offer these options. But for us to know whether the individual young people are actually getting a choice is quite a challenge. I don't know how you do that. It, it, it wouldn't be acceptable. But we could have a bunch of clever, wise people going around independently, talking to kids in schools and you know, getting an hour a week for three weeks with them. And, and, and talking through what they really want to do and, and try and help them in a more organised way. But I think it wouldn't be acceptable because parents wouldn't want, wouldn't want that and I think teachers probably wouldn't want that. Could the school inspection regime try to capture even just a, a part what? of that? The, the school inspection regime, the, the one already in existence, if, if we included criteria around this, could it try to capture some of that? I mean, again, it would be largely anecdotal, but it might be quite informative. It's trying to get the child into a position <coughs> where the parent isn't there and the teacher isn't there, um, and and they get a chance to um, to because to be fair, 
I mean, kids don't have kind of lightning clear insight. It's something you have to kind of help them, you know, work their way towards. Um, I ask lots of kids, actually, one of the things I do is, what do you want to do? <laughs> um, and I'm going to say 80% of them shrug their shoulders and they're not sure what they want to do. Um, and I, in the few occasions when I have a time to actually talk to them, the fact is that they have got some things they'd like to do. They've just never, you know, they've just never really um, thought their way towards it. So any kind of good professional, independent counselling, call it whatever you like, um, whereby we try to help kids to, to broaden out um, and, and get their in, get their in, develop their insight into what's best for them to do, would be helpful. Thank you. C can I just come in in the back of that? Sorry, and the, the we're just back from Shetland, where we did pretty much what you've just suggested, <laughs> uh, where we had pupils in a class, no teachers there, and we were asking them about the, their preferred pathways. Uh, and it, I think it works, but the, and there might be some way that that, I mean, obviously you can't have groups of 12 at a time for every pupil in the country, but there might be some other ways using online methods or whatever that you could get some of the information that Ross was talking about and that we've been trying to get. So maybe it could be spread out and, and some using the technology that is now available that you talked about earlier. It would be most interesting to get the parents' view on that. <laughs> Yes, well, we didn't talk to any of the parents, so <laughs> maybe that's how it works well. Uh, uh, Mary and then Oliver. Thank you, convener, and, and, and good morning. And, and I wanted to ask a, a, a very brief kind of follow-on question about careers advice, because one of the things that we've heard over the last few weeks is there is a huge disparity across the country of, of the quality of careers advice that young people are given. But there's also a view that if you ask the people that deliver the careers advice they tick all the boxes and they do everything. But if you ask the young people, quite often they tell you a different story. So while I understand it would be good to have a standard across the country, how, how can we measure and assess that careers advice is actually delivering what young people want? I think with great difficulty. Um, I mean, you'd have to do it with some kind of independent um, assessment. Um, I mean, frankly, the most important thing is to get across to the, 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 the senior people in the school, the headmaster and headmistress, to get them committed to giving good career advice. And I mean, really committed to doing it. So it's not just left with the, with the careers advisor or whoever, the careers teacher or whatever, whatever the key person involved. But uh, I don't think we can do it by any kind of external assessment that wouldn't be, that would be quite a ponderous thing to try and do. I mean, what we've got to do is get across to the people running the schools and responsible in the schools, um, get them persuaded. Hey, this, this employability issue is one of the most important things that they can do. It's every bit as important as the other things they do as a kind of um, um, a teacher or education person. And, and, I, and I, think we've, I think that's the way I would tackle it. I wouldn't... We don't want a whole bunch of inspectors going around and kind of um, sitting, watching how career advice is given and uh, and uh, what have you. Um, and it's 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 the is it SDS that does careers, yeah. SDS and in support of the local with each of the the schools as well. So, so yeah. we'd have to get SDS, and I think they are. I mean, I think they realise just how important this is. Whether they've got enough resources, I don't know. But a combination of them plus the kind of senior teaching in the school, really committed to getting it right. But, but we also have to ensure that, that whatever careers that advice and guidance is given is fully inclusive and, and allows young people with perhaps additional needs or with disabilities to get the right advice and help to pursue the career. And I'm, I'm not completely confident that the current system does that. I, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, I, get, I guess we've got a sense in most schools that um, the really, you know, capable kids were just left with a computer, but, but special attention was given to kids that needed some um, help. Um, I think it was probably more advice in terms of the technicality of working the computer and how you do that, as opposed to giving them some different insight into um, career choices. Mm -hmm. we, 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 I mean, we need to sort career choices 
I'm going to say it again, with work experience, um, I mean, clearly by maximising the, the impact we have in, um, in, um, in, in, in schools um, and by young people going into schools and sharing with the youngsters what they do. That's, that, 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 just, just on the issue of, of work experience, because one of the thing, things that certainly surprised me, and I, and I know it surprised um, the other committee members that were in the group that we were in in Shetland when we were talking to, to young people, is the lack of preparation that young people have when they're about to start work experience. Because we spoke to a group of young people that had no idea what was expected of them when they went into a workplace. They didn't know they were meant to be there on time. They didn't know how to talk to anybody and they didn't know what they were meant to be doing. So one in particular said they spent two days just following someone around because they didn't know what was expected of them. So surely that's a huge gap. And in a way, we're almost setting young people up to fail in that work experience, which can be really important and crucial for their, their, their ongoing career choice. And that's a bad reflection both on the school and on the work experience company, because um, both... I mean, the, 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 the school could have a very simple module, very simple, which is maybe a couple of hours, something like that, which took the youngsters who are going to work experience, prepared them for it. And the business, absolutely, um, if it's, if it's um, contributing fairly to the process, um, should have a, an induction, um, whereby it tells them, you know, what we're expecting them to do. and, and, and uh, it's, it's, it's a waste of time otherwise. Um, we're wasting everyone's time unless we get people prepared for it. Okay, I've got one very, very last brief um, question because I was particularly struck by um, the recommendation 20, and that was the recommendation you mentioned about financial support for SMEs. Um, and I'd be interested in your view on the impact that that'll have in, in rural areas. And I, I, again, I suppose I could reflect on, on the, the Shetland experience. Um, and many other rural areas in, in Scotland where there are a number of very small organisations that, that simply can't afford to take on and support an apprentice. And that has a wider impact on the, the sustainability of the business, but also the sustainability of the community. Because if that business fails, the experience, um, the experience will go somewhere else, somewhere else. Young people might be forced to leave an area. Is there anything else that should be done? apart from your recommendation 20, to support these organisations to take on young people? Um, I mean, there's two problems SMEs have. Um, one is they don't have any kind of process or resource to handle the kind of administration and planning of taking on an apprentice. And that's a big one. That's a big one. That, that's as big as the money one. Um, so... so but, but but we can sort that out. The the um, the, 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 the the various local um, em employment um, groups, the DYW groups, could easily have a resource that held the SMB's hand when they when they en engaged in the process with the um, apprentice. The the second one, um, we were actually only suggesting. I mean, there are there are some support given. I've forgotten, is it first year or second year apprenticeship? There is some support given. We were, in fact, just saying, I think we should probably give support um, for three years. Not a huge amount of money, um, but if, honestly, if we could get a bunch more SMEs to take on apprenticeships, um, I think we'd help the SMEs and would undoubtedly help the employment problem and would undoubtedly help the number of young people being trained. We'd have to ensure... There's a third problem, actually. We'd have to ensure that... In a small company, there was the level of support to look after them when they're doing their apprenticeship. Because you can't just put a cast a person and drift into a company. You've got to have someone. So, so there's a bit of work required there. But goodness me, there's a huge positive end result if we get it correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver, and then Gordon. Thank you, uh, convener. I wanted um, just to follow up on one of Mary's points uh, briefly around work experience. Do you feel that young people get enough variation? Um, in work experience or enough work experience because when we were in Shetland again some of the feedback from the young people was that you know they do they do their one week you know before some of them leave school that's all that's all the work experience they're getting and they don't have anything else to compare it to so they have one placement and they quite like it or they 
don't like it, but they don't know how, how that compares to anything else? I mean, it's, it's a trite answer. I don't think you can give young people enough work experience. <laughs> I mean, the, the more within reason, within the education requirements they're going through, the more we can give them. I mean, if we, if we, if we could get... You know, the problem is, we're lucky if we... Um, I guess maybe half the youngsters right now get work experience. But if, if, we, if we had a really good um, system which um, gave the young person three work experiences in different companies and different environments, that would be great. Frankly, even going to college is helpful because that gives them... Um, I mean, they're, they're actually practically handling joinery tools or plumbing tools or what have you. Even, even that's pretty helpful. But it doesn't... This whole question of youngsters not turning up in time. And, uh, there's some basic things, actually, they learn on, uh, from work experience. We, we had some horrific stories from employers. I may say we fell out with employers more than we fell out with schools, but we had some horrific stories from employers, um, you know, taking on kids to do things, and they turned up, you know, an hour late, and it just, it just, it was depressing. Um, but I don't think it was the norm, but, but, but young, young, there's some basic things we have to get youngsters used to. Um, and the more substantive line of question I wanted to pursue was around, um, was around rurality and consistency of approach across the country. Obviously, it's a strength uh, having the 21 different regional groups, but there's obviously quite a lot of variation within that. Thinking particularly around the, the college model, which has been regionalised as well, it's, it's obviously practically more difficult for, for some youngsters, particularly um, in the area I represent, to, to access college courses at the same time as being at school? Is that something you recognise? There definitely were, and I'm sure there still are, logistics um, issues and um, problems. And, and there's the, the problem of cost of transport, taking people around. And uh, um, I think it's worthwhile getting around that, but I'm not saying we'll get around it on, on, on every occasion. I mean, there were, there were some difficulties in that. But generally, um, that wasn't the number one concern. There were other concerns we were dealing with before that. Um, do you think there's an, enough resource going in to, to make those relationships possible at the moment? Do you mean in terms of the um, business school connections? The business school college connections, no. obviously that is, is significantly I, more challenging I, in, in, in remote parts of yeah. Scotland. I think there's a bunch of good people actually working very hard on the kind of wider delivery of the um, D DYW program, I mean, it's, it's a seven years. They've got seven years to do it, and they know it's being measured. You know, so they've they've got some clear measures, and I actually think it's a bunch of really good people trying to do that. So I hope I'm sure it's not enough, but but there's probably as much as we can reasonably make available. And the final question was, I mean, one one of the concerns uh, locally, um, again, is that there's a shortage of of of, of working age population. Um, and there's a lot of young people who, who tend to leave uh, rural communities and, and gravitate towards more urban areas. Is, is there a conflict of interest almost between the needs of employers and individual choice for young people? Because again, if we're going to, to address some of the skills shortages, then something has to be done to, to sort of encourage some of those young people to maybe pursue a path that, that isn't their choice. Is that? I guess they have to make a choice between the, the job and, and where they stay, um, and it's, it's not easy. I, I, I don't think um, I don't think it's reasonable to take a line to say to a youngster, um, "This is what you're going to do." Um, so, so um, I think the youngster's got to choose which which one they want. It's not easy. Um, it's not easy. Okay. OK, thank you, Oliver. Uh, Gordon and then Tavish. Morning, and thanks very much, convener. Um, I wanted to ask you about a couple of points you just raised. Um, you said that it would be great for um, young people to have a wider choice, maybe three options when they were doing work experience. And certainly, when I was at school many, many years ago, that's the option I had. I had three actual work experiences. Um, I've no idea. Can, can I say that the work experience that I had in the three different places had no relevance to what my career was before I entered politics? But anyway, that's a, that's a different thing. But how do we encourage SMEs um, to realise the benefits of taking on a young person to gain either work experience or, for that matter, taking them on as a modern apprentice? 
No, I mean, here's the problem. Most SMEs are working like mad to keep the business going and keep themselves viable. Um, and, and that's that's the prime priority, um, and we must respect that because that, that's that's essentially. And 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 the first thought on you know knocking on the door and saying we'd like to take on a modern apprentice, um, they've got a hundred and one other issues on on on, on the hands. Um, they've no one to deal with it. They'd have to deal with it themselves, um, and it'll it'll be a, a drain on the financial resources for the first whatever year, two years even with some kind of um, um, reasonable subsidy. Um, so it's, 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 it's not, an, I mean, I, I, we have to, I think we have to do something financially, and I think the DYW groups have got to be prepared to have resources available locally to go and spend time and help them to do it. How, how much of it do you think is a cultural issue within uh, small businesses? I mean, I've used this uh, example before, but you know, the hairdressing industry um, takes on an awful lot of apprentices and their small businesses with no resource, no HR department, etc. How do they manage it? And yet, you know, a plumber or an electrician or a joiner doesn't necessarily able to provide the same opportunity. It's, it's yeah. I, I mean, I'm not an expert in hairdressing salons, but but but. <laughs> No. <laughs> but, but in that situation, um, there's maybe five or six people working in one big room, and they can all see what's going on. Um, if you start talking about joiners and plumbers and what have you, they, you know, they move over, over the place and different, and there's safety issues. And there, there, are, there are different, there are a different bunch of um, of um, challenges. But I mean, it should be surmountable. Um, it is interesting. We've got a lot of feedback. Um, Company employees like companies taking on apprentices. They really like it. You know, we're helping train and, you know, young kids coming in with all their stories about Saturday night and what have you. They actually like it. Um, so, I mean, most of these SMEs employ, well, a, a 10 people SME is a decent sized SMP, so there may be five or six people. Um, and it is, it is a big event for them to do that. We'll make some progress there. I don't have huge hopes, but there's... How many SMEs are in the country? Thousands. How many? Thousands. I mean, it's I mean, the biggest thousands part Thousands and thousands and thousands of yeah. SMEs. Yeah. If we could get 5% of them to take on a yeah. premiership, that would have a big impact. Is, is there a role here for the trade associations, you know, like the Master Builders Federation, or the Plumbing Federation, or Select, yeah. or yeah. whoever it happens yeah. to be? They're, they're all active. They're, they're already active in the apprenticeship um, program. Right, but are they members of the regional groups, for instance? Oh, yeah, yes, yes, absolutely. Right. Yep, yep. Okay. The regional groups are pretty well, pretty widely um, representative. So the, the, the last question I was going to ask you about was, I think there's 21 regional groups, but only seven of them are currently using the, the marketplace, which is the matching tool for young people and employers on My World of Work. Is there a particular reason for that? I don't know, but it's, it's, it's bad news. It's not good. I, I, I hope it's just a question of time. Um, but, but it's a pretty, pretty poor figure out of the 21. I agree. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Tavish. And then finally, Richard. Thank you, Convener. Firstly, can I just thank the, the uh, Convener and the Committee for coming up to Sheffield in the last couple of days, particularly your contribution to the local economy. Not looking at anyone in particular, but uh, Gillian's uh, <laughs> contribution to Shetland Knitwear and things like that. And, uh, so Ian, you will not be surprised to hear that uh, in the bridge simulator at the North Atlantic Fisheries College on, f uh, on uh, yesterday, Tuesday, um, no, it's Monday. Monday. It's Monday. Monday. Two of my colleagues, who will remain nameless, managed to crash the 12,000-ton Shetland Aberdeen ferry. So uh, all kinds of political metaphors come to mind, but uh, I'm not going to use any of them. Uh, can I just uh, three quick questions, if I may? Um, the first is on a work experience that uh, that uh, Oliver Mandel and Gordon um, McDonald have been asking about, and relates to Liz Smith's question about school structure. I just wonder now you reflect after a number of years of having produced the report. Uh, we too took the very strong evidence that more work experience is, by definition, a good thing. Uh, but relating to Liz Smith's question, we've had curriculum for excellence for as long as now. Is there a connection? Is there a challenge uh, in how 2 plus 2 plus 2, the senior phase of our, our secondary schools are structured, which, which in your view, um, is a 
it just creates difficulties in terms of timetabling time out of school, because that's what it is. It's an issue about timetabling another week in our busy pupil's life. Do you, did, did you have any reflections on whether that's the block on more work experience? Yeah. I hate dodging questions, but um, I don't know enough. So, no, I, <laughs> so I'm not a politician. Yeah. I, I, I don't know enough about um, how the school planning system works. And, and I know there's, there's a bunch of challenges in terms of getting all the timetables. We're continually told that in terms of timetables working. And, and uh, I don't know, uh, um, Tavish, I don't know enough about it to say whether that's a, an impediment yeah. or not. Yeah. I think one of the good examples that we shared within the report was um, Alfie Cheen's business, Ace Winches, Ace Winches. And they were actually offering work experience on a Saturday morning. Now, they were open on a Saturday morning to be able to do that. And I think the key thing was trying to move away from it, just being a one-week work experience, because that does lend itself to, to kind of the, the model that you turn up, you, you just have a week. You're not reliant on your parents' networks. You're reliant on school, company, industry relationships through and facilitated through DYW. Now, it would obviously take time to build up to that. But employers didn't have to see it as a, a one-week only. It was actually an opportunity for them to get to know young people within their region and their area, back to how do you, you, you retain young people in your region area. And through that, actually, you could, you could actually start to identify future employees or... And it, and it would be mutual in, in two ways. So I think the idea that work experience should only be one week was not a widely held as, as best practice. And the best do more than that. And they will offer outside of the school term time. And they will also offer at weekends. Now, that clearly does not work for, for all young people either. That can, you know, to me, as a parent experiencing curriculum for excellence, the whole idea of how do you develop as an individual and how work experience maps across to that is, is, was a huge opportunity both as, as you move from the, the junior phase to the senior, you know, from school through to the senior phase. And I, I think we were still at the stage in the commission when the, the first of the senior phase were moving through. And, and so it was still unclear how that was going to, to work as you move from primary into the, the first phase and then the, the later stages. But how they map across is actually a science in itself. So how do you map pupil, pupil outcomes? How do pupils and individual young people do that? So the science of using work experience as a developmental tool within your own personal you know, journey of education through curriculum for excellence should become, I think, easier. But the work experience has to reflect that. And to reflect that, you need an intermediary who can explain and understand how curriculum for excellence is trying to build the young individual through the whole education journey and how that fits into what employers are looking for because there should be a perfect match but the language is different and one of the, the key things about the external validation of education I'm not an expert but what we did hear from employers is they found it really difficult to understand education qualifications and that was before national fours and fives had been introduced but they were coming in so I think the, the language between education and employers is really critically important in terms of both what does work experience offer for both the people, the young person, the school and the employer in the future, and how the education qualification system works. Um, yeah, so I, all of those things actually need intermediaries to help translate from, from one sector. <laughs> Language. And, uh, one language would be good, but yes. that would probably be impossible. That's Quite. understandable. But a translator yes. and manager of that process, yeah. and that's where DYW, with the right resources, can can help in the early years until that becomes embedded. Assuming, of course, the education system stays fairly stable. Yeah, yeah. Which and we don't help in that as politicians, both on exam changes and things like that. So, yeah. yeah. No, I think that's a very powerful argument. And um, the second question I was going to ask was about a young apprentice at the Malakoff um, uh, yesterday in Lerwick, uh, who is 27. He's just finished a three-year apprentice. The, the question for, that Lewis raised with us yesterday is that he took that apprentice on at 24. And what his boss was saying, what Dougie Stevenson was saying, is we could do with the system being more adaptable to allow uh, uh, young men and women to take apprentices and to start modern apprentices a little bit later in life. Did you, did you, have, a, did you have a perspective on that? What had he done before that? He was semi-skilled. He said he would have gone on being just a semi-skilled young man working for the Malakoff so until he that chance. With no, he didn't. He started. Uh, he started in a garage okay. as a mechanic. Okay. Yeah. 
I didn't want to be a mechanic. Yeah. And then became semi-skilled. And, yeah. then, and then got a job with Malakoff and, and they plugged him into a, yeah. a hall. That's great for him. What was the question? Should, should the, should the, uh, should the uh, you're very good at this, by the way, so, uh, should the 24-year-olds have an equal chance of bond apprenticeships compared to the younger boys and girls, younger men and women? I need to tell you, my years kind of perk up with Malakoff. We, we, we partly owned Malakoff for a long time. I remember that. Many yeah. years ago. Yeah. Um, I absolutely don't see why not. Um, I really don't. Um, I mean, I guess I would worry about a 55-year-old person wanting to do a modern apprenticeship. But, but, and I'm not even going to begin to say where, 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 where it's the dividing line, but, but any, any person with a reasonable career time ahead of them, I, I, haven't, I don't see any reason at all why they shouldn't be allowed to do an, do an apprenticeship and get, get the same support as young people get. Okay. Uh, thank you. The final question I was going to ask was just about the, the, how modern apprenticeships are structured. The other, I thought, telling evidence at the Fisheries College in Scalloway was the uh, lecturer there saying to us, employers are looking for us to provide courses that include not just uh, teaching young boys and girls about lathes and milling on a lathe, but actually how a 3D printer works. Because an oil rig in the future or in a ship's engine room, it's not going to be waiting for the part to arrive. It's going to be a 3D printer sitting in the corner, which will build, after the thing's downloaded, it'll build the piece of kit that's needed. Do you think the system's adaptable enough in terms of how modern apprenticeships are designed and how they change to reflect modern technology and the changing world of work around us? The, the, honestly, the, the problem is um, it doesn't matter how hard we try and get these up to date in five years' time, they're going to be out of date. So we, 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 what we must have is continuous development and training. We must have a really good apprenticeship which, which does take account of as much as possible of the new um, technology and the new equipment. And it's mind-blowing, honestly, to see, uh, to see the way things are, are being done. But we must also have um, continuous development and training. Um, I, I think we're going to have a bunch of expert digital companies who's, who's, who will make money, good money, by going around digital companies and normal companies and updating them in terms of what they can do with the digital technology. So, so I, I, I mean, every, every company must be as up-to-date as possible, um, but, but um, it's going to change. It all has yep. to try and lead that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, yep. thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. <clears throat> Firstly, just to pick up on some of the uh, other issues that were raised in terms of SMEs. I know, Serene, you were talking about the need for SMEs to take on more apprentices. I mean, I visited a very small business in my constituency on Monday, Murray um, F SFB Consulting, and Leah Fraser is a young woman there who's just started as an apprentice uh, for marketing, uh, is what she wants to pursue. Uh, so small, small businesses seem to be able to take on apprentices. <laughs> so I'm trying to work out what the obstacle is to SMEs taking on apprentices. Business? Uh, I think they've got four or five employees. Oh, okay. Then, then, then it is an SME. <laughs> yes, I know, but in terms of... That's a small end of you know SMEs, yeah. and if they can afford it, I was wondering what the obstacles were for SMEs generally, in terms of what you were seeing earlier for not being able to perhaps afford to take on apprentices. Richard, the, 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 we got really pretty consistent um, feedback. Um, I've made the point: people who own SMEs are usually up to their ears in trying to run the business. Um, and they're faced with the administration and the, the, the hassle of whatever they've got to drop to take on, take on um, an SME. Um, they're fixed with the thought, how do I help develop this SME? You know, I've got four employees. They're, they're all pretty busy. Am I going to lose a quarter of their time in the next... Um, 12 months by them focusing on the... I mean, it's all very selfish stuff, but to be fair, they're, they're trying to run a small business. And frankly, the, the finance is, is, isn't, necessarily top of the, um, isn't necessarily top of the list. So that's why I've said we, we've got to find ways of trying to give them some kind of support to do these things. Anyway, there are great examples out there of small businesses taking on apprentices, and that's good news, particularly in areas like Murray and the northeast of Scotland, which you're very familiar with. I was just going to ask for your reflections on some of the challenges facing more rural areas, where clearly there are additional challenges, particularly for different types of career options, because if you want that 
career option, you have to travel perhaps a different community elsewhere in Scotland. Um, and I made the point last week at committee that in Murray, for instance, we have less young people compared to the national average, but we also have above the national average for young people wanting to leave the area. So it's like a double whammy. And I just wondered if you had any reflections on the challenges for the opportunities for young people in more rural areas. Have you got a good college in Murray? That's my ignorance, I'm sorry. Have you Do got a good, a good college in Murray? If what? We've got Murray College, yes, yes. Murray College, yes. UHI. Yes, yes. I mean, I mean, some of the so-called rural colleges, um, so NESCO in Aberdeen, I've got a really superb college in Fraserburgh. Uh, really superb. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't visited Murray College. Of course, I'm aware of Murray College. Um, so having a good local college is actually very important in terms of um, trying to plan um, skills development and, and, and um, careers development. Um, in the rural areas, it's more difficult because there's probably less employer choices. You know, you've got, you've got less employers to, to um, work from and, and, and take apprentices on. I don't see how you get round the so-called negatives of being in a rural area. Um, it's just a fact of life. You know, you don't have the same proximity to companies and um, subcontract machining and all the other things that you you need to do to grow and develop a business. But some, some do it very successfully. I mean, they've just adapted and do it very successfully. Okay. okay, well, finally, I just want to ask you about the bigger picture in terms of your comments, quite rightly, were about the need to ensure that we are up to date with the needs of the 21st century. You mentioned the digital revolution. And clearly, again, as you'll be familiar with from the northeast of Scotland, there are various skill shortages. And more and more employers you speak to say they can't get staff for X or Y roles within their businesses. I just wondered again if you had any reflections on the bigger picture in terms of what we're talking about today and whether they're attuned to the needs of the economy for the 21st century and if they're attuned to the skill shortages we are experiencing, particularly with Brexit coming up and the potential for even more skill shortages. Do you feel that's taken into account in terms of what our colleges or schools are doing? Are they matched with the skill shortages? We don't do this, we don't do this well. Pardon? We, we don't do this well. We don't do this well, yeah. Universities don't do it well. I mean, a whole lot of kids are going to universities to study things. Well, there's a pretty high chance there won't be a job in that particular thing at the end of the day. We don't match, frankly. I don't, I don't think anywhere do we have as a criteria um, the likelihood of getting a job at the end of the day from it. It's not right. Um, I think, um, I mean, there is going to be a, a significant change um, in, 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 in the, the content of the skills and so-called modern apprenticeships are going to be ultra-technical apprenticeships, whatever, whatever, whatever we're going to call them. We should match. It's not easy because we're then saying to the youngster, I'm sorry, you can't do what you want to do but you can do this, which is where you have a better chance of getting a job. Now, frankly, that's what we should be doing <laughs> because we're spending a lot of money, but worse than that, we're possibly wasting that youngster's time in studying something which is kind of low likelihood of getting a job. But we live in a democratic society where people don't necessarily like that. You know, people like being unconstrained and able to do what they want to do. Um, but, but in terms of an ideal planning, we absolutely should make a much better attempt to match our training input to the, um, um, the output required. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Uh, and can I thank Sir Ian and Ms Croft for um, their attendance this morning and answering all these questions so fully. That was very helpful for the committee and I can assure you we'll keep you up to date with the findings of the inquiry and how, how things go. Okay, thank you very much. And I now close the public session.